Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm Phil Stone. Well, today is a first in a three-part series in which we are going to examine first to today the Christ Church shootings, in particular, why we should not give the murderer what he wants. Tomorrow, I will be talking about why, why more guns in private hands leads to less crime and might well have averted this shooting. And finally, the day after that, the true intention of the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, unless you have been living under an extraordinarily large rock in an extraordinarily deep and dark hole, you must know by now about the two, two shootings in a couple of mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. The murderer has killed 50 people, injured 50 others, and details as I record this are still coming out. As with everyone, my thoughts are with the family and victims. Um, I cannot imagine what something like this must be like, and frankly, I hope that I never, never have to find out. And I know it may be trite, but I always say it with all honesty, that is, if, if there is something that I, my family, my viewers, or my extended family of science fiction fans can do to assist or make things easier, we do stand ready to take your call. Now, I mentioned my extended family of science fiction fans in particular. I have some who watch this program. We have a lengthy history, a century or more, of helping up our own when they are down. In fact, we have always helped them up, and we have never failed to do so. It is part of who we are as fans. And while we don't know if any of the victims here specifically were fans, it is still within our power and our duty to help them up if we can. Now, I will not be using the murderer's name on this show or anywhere anything associated with me because it only emboldens other people to do copycat similar things just to get their 15 minutes of fame. So, in this instance, the murderer published a manifesto in advance and then live stream a video of himself committing his rather horrifying acts at the first of the two mosques that he went to. I have read the manifesto, I have watched the video. The manifesto is lengthy. The press calls it rambling, but it's not. From a purely, and I just mean a purely literary standpoint, it is a very well-written document. It is an excellent window into the mind of a self-professed racist and paranoid psychotic. Now, I provide a link to all of the source material, both the uh, manifesto and the uh, video at my website www.wrstone.com slash Christchurch. You can view it there. Uh, I don't have them on the site, but I have links to all of them. You cannot too long didn't read this manifesto. If you want to know everything about why and how he did what he did, it's all there. This is really one of the few instances in which someone spells out in advance, in no uncertain terms, the question that we always ask at a time like this, why? Now, if you want to watch the video, which I am not going to show, obviously, but there is a link to it on my website, be aware, it is graphic. It shows the murderer at his first location, killing an entire room filled with innocent people. And the last one is particularly grisly. Oddly enough, because he shot this by wearing a GoPro strapped to his head or his helmet or something, the video, when you watch it, is a lot like playing a first-person shooter video game of the kind that's really very common today. To me, this was very unsettling and frankly says a lot about today's nihilistic culture, about which I've talked before. There's a link to that video below as well. Now, I'm going to read some selected sections of his manifesto having to do with the United States because much of what he talks about and his motivations hinge on the United States. And insane as he is, he seems to be intelligent enough to have correctly analyzed at least some of the current sociopolitical issues that are in the United States, although it's from a racist, paranoid, psychotic perspective. Now, you have to understand in advance that I utterly condemn this man. I am a small l libertarian, which means I ascribe to the zero aggression principle, which, as is scrolling past in my lower third, always states, no human being has the right, under any circumstances, to initiate force against another human being, nor to threaten or delegate its initiation. Clearly, 
clearly this man is in severe violation of the zero aggression principle, and I completely and utterly condemn him. Though by reading his manifesto, you can get an idea into why he thought that what he did was right, twisted as though it may be. And while it's long, I think it's important to read it to you largely because the press is not going to give it to you. I certainly encourage you to read it for yourself because the press is currently mischaracterizing both the manifesto and the murderer, as are almost all politicians, using it as an excuse to smear Second Amendment supporters. The murderer is not what you think he is. He is neither conservative nor alt-right. In fact, his manifesto makes it clear that he hates them. He is neither libertarian nor leftist or, or uh, liberal. His manifesto makes it clear that he hates them. He is a self-proclaimed racist, a self-proclaimed eco-fascist. His favorite government is the People's Republic of China, and he is a paranoid psychotic. So I'm just going to read some excerpts from his manifesto here, and I'm going to put it off to the side so I can read it a little better. Here are some excerpts dealing with the United States. One of his stated purposes was, and I quote, to create conflict between the two ideologies within the United States on the ownership of firearms in order to further social, cultural, political, and racial divide within the United States. This conflict over the Second Amendment and the attempted removal of firearms rights will ultimately result in a civil war that will eventually balkanize the U.S. along political, cultural, and most importantly, racial lines. This balkanization of the U.S. will not only result in the racial separations of the people within the United States, ensuring the future of the white race on North American continent, but also ensuring the death of the melting pot pipe dream. Furthermore, this balkanization will also reduce the USA's ability to project power globally and thereby ensure that never again can such a situation as the U.S. involvement in Kosovo ever occur again where U.S. slash NATO forces fought beside Muslims and slaughtered Christian Europeans attempting to remove these Islamic occupiers from Europe. He later on in his manifesto says, and I quote again, I chose firearms for the effect that it would have on the social discourse and the extra media coverage they would provide and the effects on the politics of the United States and therefore the politics, uh, situ political situation rather, of the entire world. The U.S. is torn into many factions by its Second Amendment and the right wing within the U.S. will see this as an attack on their very freedom and liberty. This attempted abolishment of rights by the left will result in a dramatic polarization of the people in the United States and eventually a fracturing of the U.S. along cultural and racial lines. He then later says, and I quote, Civil war in the so-called melting pot that is the United States should be a major aim in overthrowing the global power structure and the West's egalitarian, individualist, globalist, dominant culture. In the United States, perhaps more than anywhere else in the world, the cult of the individual has been practiced for the longest time and with the deepest devotion. Luckily for us, the end results of this deracialized, irreligious, and deculturalized program shows themselves. The United States is in turmoil, more so than at any time in history. States hate other states. The Electoral College is under attack at every turn, and the races are at each other's throats. On top of this is a two-party political system split on racial, social, cultural, linguistic, and class divides. The end result is a nation in gridlock, unable to respond to any great change, unable to commit to any great projects, a political and social stalemate that makes any advancement impossible. Meanwhile, the 10,000-ton boulder of demographic change rolls ever forward, gaining momentum and possibly destroying all in its path. Eventually, when the white population of the USA realizes the truth of the situation, war will erupt. Soon, the replacement of whites within the Texas will hit its apogee, and with the non-white political and social control of Texas, and with this control, the Electoral College, will be heavily favored and stacked of a democratic victory so that every electoral cycle will be a certainty. After an election cycle or two with certain Democratic victory, the, those remaining non-Democratic voting, non-brainwashed whites will see the future clear before them and with this knowledge realize the impossibility of a diplomatic or political victory. 
Within a short time, regular and widespread political, social, and racial violence will commence. In this tempest of conflict is where we'll strike a strong, unified, ethnically and culturally focused pro-white, pro-European group will be everything the average white family need and long for. With these boosted numbers and with our unified forces, complete control of the United States will be possible. Above all, be ready for violence, and when the time comes, strike hard and fast. The myth of the melting pot must end, and with it, the myth of the egalitarian nation. That is what he has to say about this. Again, it is a wonderful, wonderful insight into the mind of a paranoid, psychotic racist. Now, there are some people in here that you should not blame. I would mention that the murderer's manifesto, he mentions Candace Owens as an inspiration, which is really weird, considering that the murderer is a white supremacist and Candace Owens is an African-American. If you don't know, Candace Owens is an American conservative and a political commentator and activist. Uh, she's known for her pro-Trump uh, stance, her criticism of Black Lives Matter and of the Democratic Party. She's director of communications at the conservative advocacy, advocacy advocacy group Turning Point USA, and she's also a fairly popular YouTuber, which is where I know her from. Now, Candace Owens is no more to blame for some madman's actions than, well, John Hinckley. He was the guy who attempted to pre assassinate President Ronald Reagan because he was crazy, and he thought that he was doing so to gain the favor of actress uh, Jodie Foster. Uh, Candace Owens is obviously no more to blame for the actions of a madman than was Jodie Foster. The murderer also mentions in his manifesto President Trump. He says that he admires Trump as a white supremacist, but hates him as a president. Now, for the record, I am a libertarian, but I want to go on the record as saying I do not believe that Trump is a white supremacist. There have been 10 presidents in my lifetime, and to me, the sole difference between Trump and the other nine is that Trump is a tenth. And he is no more to blame for a madman's actions than was Jody Foster. Now, additionally, at the very beginning of the video, if you watch it, he says, the murderer actually says outright, remember lads, subscribe to PewDiePie. If you don't know, PewDiePie is an extremely popular YouTuber to whom I'm subscribed, and on a couple of occasions, he has endorsed videos that belong to racist or otherwise unsavory channels. He did it without knowing it and issued retractions when he, was, uh, when he found out this information. Otherwise, his channel is completely harmless. Um, PewDiePie is no more to blame for a madman's actions than was Jody Foster. Now, in the name of full disclosure and honesty, I must admit that this murderer's actions have made me do some soul searching. I have a video called Winning the Second American Re Revolution in a Week, and you can find a link for it again in my description box below, in which I say that a revolution is in fact overdue in order to restore the Constitutional Republic. I be believe that the murderer has unfortunately correctly analyzed at least part of the socio-political situation in the United States. In my opinion, the U.S. has in fact been inching closer to civil war for some time. And this could, in fact, lead to a balkanization of the U.S. as the manifesto talks about. However, in my video, I explicitly outline how such a revolution, and that's what I think it would be, could be won quickly and bloodlessly. Now, I do not and I cannot retract what I have said precisely because I want it to be bloodless and based on constitutional, not racist grounds. The murderer gives me great fear because what he says he wants is precisely what I don't want. It's precisely why I made my video. So if you are inclined to pick up arms and wage a second American revolution, please, for God's sake, watch my video and see how it can be done quickly and bloodlessly rather than a bloody conflict that could occur and that the murderer predicts could happen and that he showed us only a tiny fraction of the blood that could be spilled. For God's sake, do not give the murderer what he wants. If there is to be a revolution, and I think it likely, let it be quick and bloodless. Do not 
give this murderer what he wants. Now, beyond to that, already socialists and communists at the federal level, along with the entire press, nation, national and worldwide, are advocating for more victim disarmament in the United States. Victim disarmament, you will hear me talk about it more tomorrow, that is the correct term for gun control. You will only ever hear, hear me refer to gun control as victim disarmament because that's what it is. And our politicians, the press, and everyone else are using this as an excuse to tar and smear Second Amendment supporters. I would note that particularly with our federal representatives, any changes in uh, any kind of victim disarmament is in abject violation of our representatives' oaths of office in which they swore to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that includes the Second Amendment. If you don't want to protect and defend the Second Amendment, you must have a constitutional amendment to get rid of it. Otherwise, they are bound by oath to protect and defend it. These socialists and communists do not understand that any significant attempt at further victim disarmament will probably trigger a revolution. Most of these representatives are from metropolitan areas that already strictly disarm their citizens, and so they assume that everyone else in the country feels the same. But they do not, and that is these politicians' greatest miscalculation. I have many veteran friends whom I acquired by virtue of teaching for three years at the place that shall not be named, and I was told by many of them that victim disarmament was their go signal and that, that should Congress further disarm victims, they would either lead or side with a revolution. And I further believe that many active duty military would also lead or side with a revolution because they took very similar oaths as our federal representatives. The only difference is they actually mean it. And they mean it so much that they have left their blood on the battlefields, watched their friends die before their eyes, and those who came home were sometimes permanently damaged at physi physiologically and or psychologically. And they take this oath very damned seriously, and they do not believe that being discharged has or will ever relieve them of that oath. If you're a United States congressman, senator, president, or judge, I urge you to stop you are currently treading on extraordinarily thin ice. Because while I have outlined how a revolution can be won in a week and bloodlessly, my voice is very, very small. And the voices advocating for violence are very, very large. I do not want a bloody second American revolution, but I fear that it's near. And I beg those of you at the federal level to stop what you are doing before you trigger it. Do not give this murderer what he wants. And that's all I have to say about that for today. So tune in tomorrow for the second part of this series, which I'm calling Morgan's Less Crime. So thank you very much for watching. If you like what I'm doing, please do like, sub, hit the notification bell, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. If you like what I'm doing, I would appreciate your support, either by subscribe stars, my PayPal tip jar, or a link to uh, my website where you can find out more ways to subscribe to me, and there are links to all of these in my description box below. So do thank you for watching Tales from SYL Ranch. And remember, for a breath of fresh air, watch Tales from SYL Ranch. News and commentary from the heartland. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.